exclusively devoted to the villages with news, commentary, and more. And yes, they have Tom's Picks, a free referral for people who are looking for a company to do work for them. Tom's Picks will refer the company that fits your needs, and all we ask is that you tell them where you heard about them. Call Tom's Picks at 804-1223 and pick up your copy of The Village Spectator today. Now read Ocala Downtown Newspaper Online. Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! All right, 20, 25 minutes before 10 o'clock. I'm, I'm still trying to break through this cold, that, yeah. cold that I'm still working with. Uh, you know, every day we read the news, and, and every day you see, you see these stories, and, and you say, "Oh my goodness, what is what is happening to the world?" And when you uh, when you sometimes think about some of these stories, and you and you realize that um, the worst possible scenario is not really that far fetched. It, it's it's a pretty scary world out there. Sometimes our uh, novelists, our our, um, our fiction writers, sometimes nail it right on the head and give us a better. Uh, view of what we might need to know in advance before it happens. I'll just put it that way. Dan Perkins is on the phone. I believe he's been with us before. Um, he is a registered investment advisor and author, but we're not talking about investments right now, other than investing in some wise decisions, maybe, about the future. His book is called The Brotherhood of the Red Nile, America Rebuilds. This is book two, which is why I think he was on before with the... Um, with this first book. This is book two of the Brotherhood Trilogy on Terrorism Against the United States by the Brotherhood of the Red Nile. So let's take it from there and say good morning to Dan. Dan Perkins, good morning, Dan. Good morning, and thank you for having me on your show. You're welcome. Where are you right now? I'm in Sanibel Island, Florida, south of you. All right. Hey, he's right on the street. Not too far. All right. And do you recall being with us, by the way? Do, do you recall that? Yes. Okay. I do. I do. All right. So when, when I say that our fiction writers will look into the future somewhat for us, I mean, this is not that far off into the future, this particular book, right? No. It's, it, it people, um, if you might recall on the cover of book one, it said that uh, book one, the first book in the trilogy uh, it said that uh, this book is as current as today's headlines, but scarier than tomorrow's. And what's really um, uh, prophetic about what you just said is that of the four scenarios, I have the same frog that you have. <clears throat> the, the four scenarios in, in book one, uh, one has already happened, and uh, one was talked about by the President of the United States. Uh, you may recall... Oh, about two months ago, the Wall Street Journal reporter who reported about the attack on the, on the power plant in, in California, where they took out 17 transformers and shut down the, the power plant, and the government said nothing to us about it until she reported it, and um, they, had, they couldn't figure out why they had not said anything to the American people. I don't think they wanted to tell the American people that our power grid is so, such a vulnerable issue right and, right and that was in book one and then we had the president when he was at the hague about a month ago was talking about being questioned about uh putin and what was going on in the ukraine and and he made the comment that that uh, mr putin is a regional power and he's in a dispute with his neighbors my greatest concern and this is almost an exact quote right. my greatest concern is that there's a nuclear device in manhattan and that's scenario number two in the book. So <clears throat> either he's reading the book or, yeah. uh, as you said earlier, the things that I've talked about as, mm -hmm. as possible threats and right, possible right. attacks are not that far-fetched. And, and there was this theory, and, and please forgive me for saying something that, that's considered to be uh, um, unfeasible or unlikely, but there was this theory that that Malaysian Airlines plane was taken for that very purpose of planting nuclear weapons on it. Mm -hmm. Have you heard? Um, you know, they, they still haven't been able to find it. That is, is, it is the most bizarre wild goose chase I've ever seen and a great disappointment to the technology capabilities of the world that they yeah. can't find that massive airplane. By the way, just to comment on the statement that the president views the uh, the issue with Ukraine and so uh, and Russia as uh, their problem. Um, they're, they're at the end of the Annie Hall movie, which I just watched for the first time, 
the, the, the Woody Allen writes into the script that he's taking some pleasure in knowing that, the, that one of the movies he recommended she went to see with her new boyfriend. It was called The Sorrow and the Pity. I looked up The Sorrow and the Pity. It's a real movie. Mm. And basically what it is, I don't know if you, if you know this, Dan, but it's an old, old black and white film that mm, basically no. documents the apathy that the world had, specifically France in this, in this movie, uh, toward the Nazis and, and how they did, that they did nothing. Well, back then. Oh, wow. They did nothing. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of, when I saw that, I thought, well, that's the same thing that's happening now. We're saying, well, that's their little dispute. We, we should yeah, until it becomes World War III. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you, you, if you think about it, we, uh, um, there's, I, don't, I, I wish I could remember who said this, but those who forget their past are destined to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think about the, it, <clears throat> I don't know how old the two gentlemen you are. I'm 69 years old. I wasn't alive during the Second World War, but I studied a lot about the Second World War and prior to the Second World War. And the practical, the, the practical analysis that I did is that if you go back and look at the founding of this country, we have always been an isolationist nation. We were drug into the First World War. We were drug into the Second World War. We, by and large, <clears throat> excuse me, as a country, have been more focused on ourselves right. than the rest of the world. It was only after the Second World War that we became a global power. But we, are, we have regressed, in my opinion, we've regressed to... Uh, uh, an appeasement philosophy, uh, as the president said, lead from behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have I have something for the, both of you to uh, to think about. And I'm 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 going to be a little bit controversial, but that's okay. That that's is okay. What we, that's what we do. I think that President Obama is the poster child for the chickenfication of the United States. The chicken vacation, okay. Yeah. Not if to be associated at, with Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Right, right. Not to be associated. <laughs> I don't know whether you get those commercials up in Ocala, but I hear them all the time here in Florida, that the testosterone level of the male in the United States yes. is at a third, third, <laughs> third generation low. Yeah. Third yeah. generation yeah, low. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, look at how the Russians are portraying Putin internally and to the world, and how the Russians are portraying Obama. And the way that Putin is out riding bareback with no shirt on, he's shooting, he's hunting. Yeah, he's, he's a Marlboro you know, man. Yeah, he's, right. a, he's an ugly Sarah Palin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but when, we, when they show pictures of, what, of Obama, what do we have? On his bicycle with his little helmet on, writing. But let, you know, this, it is similar to when Jimmy Carter was president because the, the world kind of looked at us the same way back then. And, <laughs> and when the hostages weren't, weren't going anywhere anytime soon until Reagan took office, do you remember how quickly they let those hostages go? Oh, I agree. They knew I, what was I, coming. Yeah, because right. they saw, uh-oh, uh-oh, yeah. uh-oh, we better get our act together. This guy, he means business, so. Yeah, well, you know, I thought it was interesting that the, uh, the op-ed uh, writer for the New York Times, Mr. Brooks, interviewed on Meet the Press a couple of weekends ago, said that, quote, the president, as it relates to Middle East foreign policy, needs to, quote, man up. Mm -hmm. Gr grow a pair. Well, yeah. You know, you know what I think? Just to be different and, and to be the devil's advocate, so to speak, or to defend the president in a way, and, 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 and Carter. Now, hold on now. Oh. I think there's, there's a sentiment that we want to believe, and that is that you can diplomatically solve any problem. In other words, I can go to my neighbor, and I can talk to him reasonably, and he'll put down his gun. But there are certain people you just cannot be diplomatic with. You can't, right. you can't be reasonable with unreasonable people. Like, and, yeah. that, and that's why uh, an intelligent, reasonable person makes a mistake by thinking everybody else is going to be reasonable. Think This, the, this guy the, who's the, stealing these Nigerian <laughs> girls. Yeah, have a conversation with Hitler. How'd that go? You know, well, if you think about what you just said, look at, look at what happened <clears throat> when this all started to happen with the Ukraine. What did the Secretary of State and the President of the United States say? Mr. Putin, your tactics are 19th, 20th century. We're in the 21st century. They don't work. Well, guess what? They, they work. did work. Yeah, they yeah. did work. And so, who, as you're saying, they tried to intellectualize or rationalize, you know, and, <clears throat> and our, I have to say, I don't know which is the bigger joke, um, 
Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State or John Kerry as Secretary of State. I mean, if you look at what she didn't do to this terrorist organization in Africa that's captured all these girls and refused, refused with the Treasury Department and congressmen and senators from both sides of the aisle desperately asking her to declare this organization a terrorist organization, she refused to do it. But when they captured the girls, all of a sudden she was outraged and they were terrorists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. Kerry, on the other hand, I thought his uh, his his comment about Isra- Israel being an apartheid country <laughs> was just idiotic, sure, and, and sure, yeah. uh, uh, I, I just don't understand where these people are coming from. Yeah, and, well, and you have to, and you know what he did later on? He backtracked and he said, "Ah, I used the wrong word. I meant to say, you know." Yeah, that worked real well. But well, either way, I mean, if you don't understand the words you're using, don't use them. <laughs> yeah, Joe Biden. Uh, <laughs> All right, Thank so, you very much. So, <laughs> so Dan, uh, Dan Perkins on, on the phone with us. His new book is called The Brotherhood of the Red Nile. And to be fair to the, the book, now we do have some, we've stimulated some phone calls. I want to make sure we get them in. But, but okay. first, let's be fair to the story in the book. Give us a, a movie trailer. Uh, Which there might be very soon a movie trailer according to the cover here, right, Dan? That's correct. We're in the, in the, we hope to have the screenplay finished by the middle of uh, June. Oh, nice. And, and um, there's a lot of interest in the, in the story. Did so. you tell them they had to shoot some of it in Florida here? <laughs> <laughs> Just north of you. A lot of it's going to be shot in Georgia. But that's another reason. We, uh, we can talk about that. Oh, oh that, that is so nice. huge. That is huge. You want to go to, the, to, to book two. Book two is, if, if, if you understand the trilogy concept, <clears throat> book one is what I call a psychological thriller, meaning that uh, the group is being formed, uh, they start, start discussing their, their attack, where they're going to attack, what kind of attack they're going to have, then they get the, the bombs rebuilt, then they present their four scenarios, and they have a vote, and they bring the bombs into the United States, and then the um, book one ends <clears throat> with a very start, startled <laughs> Dramatic ending, I think, is the best way to say it. Uh-huh. There's only there's only two emotions about the ending of book one. You either love it or hate it. But it's interesting. Everybody tells me that they hated it, wanted to know at the time how soon was book two going to come out so we could see what happened. <laughs> mm-hmm. book, That's book why they hated is, it. <laughs> right, I guess. Book two starts out 12 hours before the end of book one. The bombs go off. I'm not going to tell the people where. But all of a sudden, <clears throat> America has to has to take a real hard look at itself <clears throat> excuse me, and how it's going to try and survive. And you close the banks, you close the stock markets, not for a few days like what happened on September 11th, but you close them and don't have any idea when they're going to be open again. You've got to worry about how do you feed the American people. Um, with the banking system closed, how do people get money? Uh, credit disappears. All of these challenges happen because of this, this, these two attacks that are brought against us and against our economic system. And in, in book one, uh, the, the leader says to the group, his terrorist think tank, we, we must examine what al-Qaeda did wrong in their decision-making process. And so they know that they have to, to in order to, to do this, if they're going to use these nuclear weapons against the United States, they have to put them in a place where the ramifications and the recovery will take decades, not days. And Manhattan is the place, right? Well, that's one of the places that it could be used, but I'm not going to give it away for your readers yeah, yeah. Uh, or my readers who want to see. But but anyway, our listeners, how does, your readers. <laughs> how does the government? How does the government function when it can't meet? Uh, there's not a quorum. There aren't enough congressmen and senators to have a quorum in mm. Washington D.C. So the president has to basically govern by executive order, and and there's a bad guy in in the government and. But <clears throat> the whole idea here is to try and help the American people understand, one, how vulnerable we are as a nation and how realistically and potentially dangerous uh, these four scenarios, any one of the four scenarios would be. Um, and when, when the other three aren't chosen, it doesn't mean that they're not as viable. It's just that the fourth one that's chosen has the they have believe this is the greatest impact and so you get its insight uh one lady one lady read, read the book and wrote a review on amazon from canada and she said mr perkins gives us great insight into the workings of the white house 
the decision-making process, and how does the government function under enormous pressure of nuclear attacks? That, that is really absolutely important. And here's why I say it's important, is because there's a practical application to the fictionalized story, is because if we look at this as a, po- a real possibility, then maybe we can prevent it from ever happening. Exactly. The, the problem is that when it so, really did happen, but although a small level, and I'm not trying to dim, dim, diminuize whatever the word is, the diminish. September 11th attacks, yeah. But we should have, at that point, that should have been the point where we said, okay, this is never going to happen. Nothing like this is ever going to happen again. And we said that for a few months. Mm-hmm. And then we, we became complacent. Sl- sl- complacent, thank you. Well, I think his book is somewhere on a shelf on the worst case scenarios. And they're taking preparations. And we should. I we hope should, anyway. We should pay attention to what he wrote. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate that. All right, you want to go to the phones? Sure. Dum, 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 dum. All right. We don't know if they're going to agree or disagree with what we said earlier. Let's find out. Dan Perkins is our guest. The book is called The Brotherhood of the Red Nile. And good morning. You're on the air. Thank you for waiting. Hey, thanks, Larry. And uh, good morning, WOCA. And uh, Dan uh, uh, Perkins, you're 69 years old. I heard your comment earlier about uh, the uh, power, power grid in uh, California concerning, uh, I guess, a particular set of transformers. I, I don't know uh, why it wasn't released immediately to the public, but if you look at it from a uh, from a security standpoint, uh, from the inside out, um, you would think that it would maybe not be immediately wise to let let the citizens know in that area or the whole nation uh, how vulnerable you are, or that whatever was done intentionally uh, mm-hmm. had a success rate. So uh, there can be some strategic or, or uh, strategy behind not releasing information. Also, uh, to combine the the, the alarmist rate that it, that it would have on a citizen rate. You may not, in other words, you may not want to let your enemy know uh, that they were effective. So from a, from a Marine Corps standpoint, and speaking of, uh, of, of the name Perkins, Dan, are you familiar with John Perkins, the author? Mm-hmm. Uh, have you read his book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman? No, I haven't. Is it good? Well, you know, your first, your first book, Dan, sounds kind of interesting. The second one seems... Uh, so catastrophic to this uh, 11-year veteran of the Marine Corps and a Desert Storm veteran that I would have a little trepidation. Uh, but I would I would say, uh, uh, out of uh, respect to your second book and with the, the knowledge you would have had writing the first book, that it sounds like um, uh, the, the provisional government that would take over has already been set in place under the auspices of the Patriot Act. A lot of these things have become uh, official them. And we do have the ability to uh, reconfigure ourselves in, in different different locations geographically and, and politically and, and legally and physically. So um, I'm not saying that it would, it would be a seamless uh, transition, but you are aware of that, right, Dan? Yeah. I, I think what I tried to do in pointing out in, in the scenarios is to say to the American people, um, look, w- w- my job as an author is to paint a picture with words and to tell a story. And, and, and writing fiction and, and thrillers is to make people – scared a little bit but hopefully make them think and if you if you read the book uh from the standpoint of how the government would have to function uh there's there's lots of things in the constitution that would allow uh a reformation of the government uh with the states <clears throat> states in control but the, the the reason why that particular scenario didn't work in my mind was if you look at what was chosen as the attack sites the ability to <clears throat> to to mobilize and move not only politicians but people was dramatically impacted and without energy in the united states <clears throat> a lot of things come to a halt and <clears throat> when they come to a halt uh the decision making process gets influenced because you can't bring enough people together in order to build a consensus and in it in it created a situation where um, when you when you have a situation, as I illustrate in, in, in book two, and you try and get the government to function to try and protect the people mm-hmm. and, and do the best it can in providing it, its need and care, um, it's really uh, uh, <clears throat> it's a tough job, a uh, dangerous job. And, um, you know, uh, there was a discussion recently about the attack on September 11th that the greatest fear wasn't the two planes that hit the World Trade Centers and the one that hit the Pentagon and the one that went down in the field in Pennsylvania. And the greatest fear in the government at the time was how many more planes 
are potential missiles that are going to fall in other places. Right. Which right. is one of, the, one of the reasons why they brought them down. They said everybody had to get down on the ground within a certain period of time or you would be shot down. I thought it was interesting, <clears throat> my take on the plant in California. They closed that plant with 100 rounds of ammunition. 100 rounds. And they're, they, they posted video on the Internet where you can actually see the flashes at the end of the weapons as they launch their, their rounds towards the plant. The other thing that, that she talked about but didn't get as much play as the California plant was another group <clears throat> came up the Tennessee River and attacked one of the nuclear facilities. I think both of those, this is my opinion, both of those were probes to see whether it was possible to bring these things to close these plants down and the grid is like a spider web mm -hmm. when you start taking down one it puts more pressure and so there is a there is a, 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 a an effect you close enough of these plants you're going to bring down the entire grid and then where do we how do we survive as a nation without electricity i thought it was absolutely i i, I hate to use the word but it was hysterical when <clears throat> the alarm went out in the in the in the plane in california the sheriff's department came up to the plant there was a chain on the gate. You know what they did? They left. Hmm. <laughs> they left. <laughs> Holy wow. macro. Oh, they could, wow. They could, there was no, no way for the, the, the plant people to communicate to the sheriff to go on, unlock the gate. To You've got to be so, kidding me. No, it's absolutely true. You can, you can see it on the Internet. So. By, by, by the way, when, when we talk about the, the like, uh, nuclear attack, this, this morning there was a report from the Telegraph, or the, the British newspaper, the Telegraph, that they've just found the, the casings, I guess you would say, from the, the bombs that delivered the chlorine gas in Syria. So, mm -hmm. so it might not be nuclear. It might be something where buildings don't fall down, but people simply die. I mean, can you imagine the horror of that? The city, well, I, the city of whatever, name the fill in the blank, becomes a ghost town because everybody dies. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, or, the, or the other alternative is that, and, and we, when we, again, we, when we think in terms of a nuclear attack, we think of blowing down buildings. And in, in the case of, of, in my book, we, we do destroy a town. However, the technology exists that a nuclear device could be exploded over certain sections of the United States, and it's called a, 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 a pulse bomb. And yes. it, basically, it basically doesn't destroy the buildings. It destroys all the communications infrastructure, fries all the computers, all the telephone systems, everything, yeah. so that there's no, no way to communicate. So they don't destroy anything, but they destroy our ability to communicate with a, with a uh, bomb uh, set off in the air. Well, that's that. a scary thought. We are, we are so dependent on electricity. Some would still say it's a privilege, but it's a necessity at this point in time. Sure in is, sure is. If you, if, you read, if you read book two, you'll understand how important electricity is Dan, and how I, much we take for granted. I think last time you were on was about the time that the, uh, the news was reporting that the <clears throat> Pentagon was asking for novelists to give them ideas of what could happen. And I, I, I remember asking you if you had ever considered you know, submitting something to them. And, and, uh, and, and I'm guessing that's the whole purpose of having people who have an imagination that can foresee the future, at least think in terms of how the bad guys think. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's how we prepare ourselves is by doing that. Well, if, if nothing else, the, the book is, is as entertaining as any movie. In fact, going to be a movie. I soon. know. And then some filming. In, I want keep me keep me up to date on this, Dan. I want to be a part of that with Georgia. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay. This sure. Dan is an actor, by the way. You want to be in the movie? Okay. Yeah, he's a absolutely. handsome. He's a handsome actor. So Good. He, he could play your lead. Well, I don't want that for us. <laughs> uh, the book again. Oh, I have a copy of the book. You might want George Clooney. You inscribed somewhere. something in the book, and I can't read your handwriting. Do well, you that's the, uh, that's typical. I, I probably said that the the, the book uh, the the book. Well, I can read part of pe it. People who read the book say that this book should have a warning. Sticker on. Oh, there okay, that's go. what it says. And it says, "Do not start this book <laughs> after 9 p.m." I've had, and I have, I'm, I am shocked at the number of people who send me emails. It, you know, book two is a 500-page novel. It's a heavyweight novel. That pe people send me emails that they read the entire novel in one setting. <laughs> it is a and big I book. Had, <clears throat> I had one guy send me. He wrote. He read books one and two. In three days. All right, let me give this one away because we've got to run, uh, and then we'll find out how the rest of us can buy it. Good morning. You've got the book. Who's this? 
Hi, this is Charles. The last two books I gave to my wife, they were romantic. This one's for me. This one is for you. <laughs> and it's inscribed by the author. You got an autographed copy. Great. Thank it'll, you very much. It'll be much. waiting for you. Very interesting. Dan Perkins, uh, again, the book is called The Brotherhood of the Red Nile. We've got 20 seconds. Do you want to give us any other information, website or anything? Sure. My website is Dan Perkins, the word at, A-T, Sanibel.com. Provide all kinds of information, links to buy the book, videos, all kinds of stuff. And uh, you can buy the book at Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com or right. order it in your bookstore. All right, excellent. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> great interview, great conversation. We've got to move forward. This is WOCA Ocala. Hang in there. Matt Gibbs is up next. We'll be right back. Fox News Radio, I'm Pat O'Neill. A raging wildfire in the Texas Panhandle has destroyed 100 homes, scorching some 1,500 acres. Police Chief Monty Leggett in Bridge, Texas. Working on hot spots, trying to protect structures if possible. Uh, we still have quite a few things on fire, and the wind is killing us. Winds of up to 30 miles per hour expected all day. Two regions of Ukraine voting for self-rule. An election official in the rebel stronghold of Donetsk saying 89% of... 